afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, the uh, series that I'm going to present, uh, as we have said, is a, a multicentric study. Uh, mostly um, uh, of the patients were operated from the University of Strasbourg, which served as the sponsor university for this uh, study, which ran between 2001 and 2015. Um, the um, raise of uh, the compressive craniectomies in the last 10 years uh, has been one of the matter of debate in the last few days. And if we stick to the number, we can uh, uh, see that basically um, in 2017 and 2018, the number of uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, publications uh, been roughly 200 per year. Uh, if we compare to 2007, uh, uh, where the uh, number of publication of the compressing craniectomy and carioplasties was only uh, a little more than 50, we have a fourfold increase. And this basically testified the interest of the neurosurgical community, but not just the neurosurgical community, also um, plastic surgeon, maxillofacial surgeon, and so on and so forth, toward uh, uh, materials for uh, uh, cranioplasty. Um, and effectively, the uh, uh, amount of uh, literature that we have uh, nowadays uh, does not uh, describe, uh, does not show any evidence of a superiority of one material over the others. Uh, we can certainly tell that uh, each of the materials used for uh, custom-made cranioplasty has certain advantages and disadvantages, including uh, uh, autologous bone, which, as you know, might uh, have a significant risk of bone resorptions, and therefore uh, requiring a secondary cranioplasty in the long term. Uh, therefore, the um, main question that neurosurgeons should ask themselves is not which material would be superior than the other, but uh, uh, the question should rather be reformulated and we should ask ourselves which kind of uh, material would suit better uh, uh, the specific needs of uh, the specific patient that we have in our list. And uh, this uh, study, as we say, uh, will revolve solely around uh, uh, porous hydroxyapatite. And why porous hydroxyapatite? This is a material uh, that um, uh, basically uh, represents a very good solution in terms of uh, um, bioengineering characteristics for uh, several reasons. Hydroxyapatite is uh, one of the uh, components of uh, uh, autologous bone, and therefore this explains uh, the very low rate of uh, uh, um, OST reaction. And therefore, from an immunological perspective, uh, uh, hydroxyapatite, uh, porous hydroxyapatite is certainly uh, a very good material. Then the size of those uh, porous uh, uh, is also quite interesting because uh, uh, roughly 70% of uh, uh, the cranioplasty will account for porous of uh, 200 micrometers. Now, this is not uh, uh, yet uh, uh, nanometric uh, scale, so we're far away from uh, uh, discussing nanomedicine topics, but still uh, from a biological perspective, uh, it's uh, a huge advantage. And I will show you why. If we compare on the left side, the microstructure of um, um, a normal bone compared to the uh, microstructure of a porous hydroxyapatite, you can tell that uh, we have copied very well uh, uh, natural uh, bony anatomy. And this is particularly useful because we believe that one of the main advantages of porous hydroxyapatite is that uh, in the long term, uh, this kind of custom-made cranioplasty will behave like living bone and therefore will uh, uh, provide most of the benefits of uh, autologous bone. The uh, randomized uh, the uh, multicentric trial that uh, we have run in uh, Strasbourg and um, uh, also from uh, a few units in Italy, where we have a, a long-standing tradition of using porous hydroxyapatite, as I say, was uh, um, designed to uh, address one specific research question, uh, and this was the safety and efficacy of uh, porous hydroxyapatite. And for this reason, we have uh, considered um, both adult and pediatric population, and we defined specific exclusion criteria. 
And uh, as you can tell from those exclusion criteria, we were trying to minimize as much as possible uh, the inclusion of patients that uh, had a higher risk for a, a specific type of uh, surgical complication in order to be as much uh, uh, realistic as possible regarding uh, the effectiveness of uh, uh, this kind of uh, materials in providing uh, uh, immediate and uh, long-term uh, 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 outcome, good outcome for our patients. In terms of the um, in terms of the um, uh, endpoint, uh, we have considered therefore all type of uh, uh, complications, both surgical and non-surgical, and we have uh, graded them according to the need for redo surgery. And uh, this is one of the table uh, that. Uh, gives us some idea of the demographics of the patient, including this study. Uh, as you can see, the male to female ratio was uh, two to one. And um, basically most of the patients uh, uh, required uh, uh, surgery for uh, uh, primary cranioplasty. And this kind of primary cranioplasty was uh, done uh, mostly in patients with a traumatic brain injury, previous traumatic brain injury, therefore uh, primary decompressive craniectomy to control ICP but also patients who had uh, malignant MCA stroke. Uh, and certainly these uh, uh, type of patients represented the majority. In terms of um, uh, primary endpoint, well, we had uh, only 25 patients who had uh, uh, any type of uh, complication following a cranioplasty. Now, if we look at the number of patients that effectively required redo surgery, this is uh, much smaller, only nine. Uh, and therefore, we can tell that uh, um, the overall number of uh, uh, complication following uh, porous hydroxyapatite cranioplasty was very small, possibly smaller than uh, complication rate reported by other uh, groups uh, who studied both porous hydroxyapatite or other type of materials. And uh, in particular, uh, we've seen um, only 6.8% of infection, which is very, very low, and only 2% of uh, fractures. Now, the number of fractures uh, that we have reported is uh, much similar to the one previously reported by Yaccarino et al., and certainly is much smaller than the one reported by Moles. Uh, in his article from 2018, he reported 22% of uh, fractures. Now, this uh, figure is extremely high, and certainly, uh, very different from the one previously reported. And I believe it highlights much more some issues in terms of patient selection rather than in terms of material use. And, uh, and that's the reason why the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria from our study were particularly strict. Look uh, um, basically uh, at this, uh, uh, this uh, slide. Here, basically, we, we can tell that uh, this bone, uh, this custom-made cranioplasty within uh, six to 12 months uh, will actually be uh, habitated by osteoblast. And therefore, that's the reason why it will effectively in the long-term behave like a living bone. Uh, the reason for this is the um, microstructure of these uh, custom-made cranioplasties. And this has been uh, documented both uh, in uh, um, anatomological studies, but also uh, through uh, nuclear medicine investigation, which allowed to track those osteoblasts. And uh, again, this is another slide that uh, demonstrates uh, uh, that the size of those uh, porous is, is particularly relevant, especially when we consider that uh, a good 30-40% of those uh, porous uh, might have a, a diameter that is much smaller than the 200 micrometers, which is the uh, uh, most common one and they could have a, a diameter of just 40 micrometers. So very, very small. In the, uh, basically, in conclusion, uh, uh, this uh, uh, study demonstrated that uh, porous hydroxyapatite uh, is extremely safe, and the number of complications uh, uh, in our series was certainly much smaller than previously reported, highlighting the importance of considering uh, a good patient selection. And therefore, this brings back to my initial statement that we should ask uh, ourselves which kind of material uh, suits better our patient's needs. So for instance, I would not consider porous hydroxyapatite uh, for patients with uh, movement disorders who are 
who have a, a high risk of a falls, nor for patients with a, a history of uh, epileptic seizures. Certainly, this is a material that uh, in our hands uh, demonstrate to be particularly useful for uh, pediatric patients. And uh, the fact that uh, we have demonstrated um, uh, uh, bone ingrowth within the cranioplasty certainly justified a very low rate of infection. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. This is the publication on ward neurosurgery from earlier this year. Um, I'm open to any questions should you have one. Thank you so much. Thank you.